Now, going back to actually going back to RAM now. Um, this is the RAM that actually came with my MacBook. I dismantled my MacBook a little bit and what they give you is this is standard Apple RAM and this is just to show that Apple RAM is no is not is nothing special. These are Samsung DIMMs and um, so made by Samsung. And as you can see, they gave me a pair of one gigabyte modules. Cast latency is running at 555, not the best. And honestly, for the prices or for the premiums that Apple charges for the RAM, they could really do a lot better. I would have expected to get Crucial RAM or what would really be nice is Corsair. Either Corsair or OCZ or some hardcore overclocking memory. Because really for the premium that Apple charges for the RAM, that's what you should be getting. You should be getting some crazy Corsair memory. Or, you know, just really or good good solid Kingston memory or crucial memory. In my case they gave me Samsung, I really don't care. Memory is memory, but if you're gonna charge the premiums that Apple charges for their RAM prices, that's what you should be getting, but you know, they, they try and make their profits some way. And this white gunk that you actually see on the chip, this is to facilitate the installation of the memory into the memory slot. So from what I read, this white stuff is electrically neutral. So it's not going to impede the electrons and it's not going to do any harm to the chip because you have gold plated contacts anyway, so it's not like it's going to corrode through gold. And in addition to that, uh, it's just to make sure that it slides in a little more gently in the motherboard and by default, all memory chips come with this gunk on it anyways from Apple. So if you ever do upgrade your memory and you see this white gunk on your on your uh, RAM chip, don't worry about it. That's just how it is straight from the factory. Um, and that's just, once again, to facilitate on installation. Um, so that covers the RAM. This is the actual hard drive that came with my MacBook. Uh, it's a Hattap. Hitachi model number 5K25160. I have no idea what that means, but what I do know is that this is a per this uses perpendicular based recording. I did a little Google searching on this model number, and everything I came across is that this uses perpendicular recording. So the aerial density on this hard drive is actually really high. And once again, for those of you uh, what aerial density is. It just means that the uh, the bits, the bits are packed together tightly on the actual magnetic platters of this hard drive. And that actually makes a difference in read and write and copy performance. Now, for instance, I was coming from a Toshiba 120 gigabyte hard drive that didn't use perpendicular recording. Uh, it was it was a fine drive. It did it did its job. And what I, would, what I would do is that when I hooked up my external FireWire drive, 7200 RPM Maxter hard drive with 16 megs of L2 cache. That's my external drive. That's my main backup drive, actually. So I would hook it in FireWire, and I would do my, my backups to and from it. And the average read and write speed was about 8 megabytes per second. Anywhere from 8, 10, 10 was fast, 8 was average. Now... Uh, so that was when it was connected to my old 120 gigabyte hard drive. With the increase in aerial density on this hard drive, I find that read and write speeds have increased by 50%. So average read and write speed is now 12 megabytes per second. So there's a nice speed bump just because of the fact that the aerial density increased. They're both spinning at the same rotational speed. They're both 5400 RPM hard drives. Both the same factor same form factor and both have the same 8 megabytes of cache built in. The difference is the aerial density and the perpendicular recording and that alone was able to give me a nice 50% speed bump when I read and write to my drive. So nice improvement there. <clears throat> and in addition to that there's also the uh, super drive that comes with it. Super drive read and write performance has improved also most notably on rewritable optical media, such as CD rewritable, DVD rewritable, things of that nature. So rewritable optical media, I got a nice little speed bump. Also, even when I'm just copying data from a DVD, such as when I'm ripping a DVD for personal use, or 
if I'm just copying lots of data off of a normal DVD, it reads, I notice it does read a little bit faster as well. So it's a nice upgrade on that for my super drive also. Here are the ports on the side of my MacBook. <clears throat> um, you know, is this looks identical. I mean, I couldn't tell the difference looking at the ports here. Only thing that you might want to note is that when you're plugging stuff in, uh, there is a little bit of a difference in the USB ports. Now, I was listening to a Mac break weekly a while ago. This is maybe a couple months ago. And they said that the way that they route the power on the USB ports is that this port actually carries more power than this port. This was an issue when when someone was trying to use either an EVDO card or uh, plug in, in their iPod or something. So if you're going to run anything that requires its own power, such as an iPod, iPhone, you might want to make sure that you charge on this port that is closest to you versus this port. This port, uh, the power is routed and this shares uh, power with the same bus as the eyesight camera, as the trackpad, as the keyboard. So, <clears throat> so this, this port is plugged into, this, into the same bus as all the other internal system devices. This runs on a separate USB bus, so that means more power should flow into it. So if you're going to hook up your iPhone or iPod and you need to charge it up, use this port. Now, 